Each year, Electrolux Appetite for Excellence seeks out the best young chefs, waiters and restaurateurs in Australia to innovate, educate and motivate to be the best in their field. One of the best parts of our program is the annual produce tour, where our national finalists are taken to a region to explore the local award-winning produce. Recently, our group embarked on an unforgettable journey in Tasmania. What you're about to see is a tantalising glimpse into Tassie's passionate producers. I just want to congratulate all of you to getting to this stage of the competition. We're very proud of the great diversity and quality of product that, that we produce and grow in Tasmania. Uh, we're really pleased that you know the next generation of the food industry are here to experience Tasmania. So on that note, can I just again say welcome and uh, have a great time here and cheers. So today was the first stop on our uh, produce tour for the week. So this morning we headed out to Hill and Agriculture. We farm salmon in this region. So what we're going to do is take a run right down through the middle of our main farming region. You'll see a few farms on the way past and you'll also see um, some of our technology that we use. Going to one of those farms, I've never done that before in my career. And when you get there, you actually understand what the farmers go through every day to produce the fish. They're quite small fish in there. When they come in with us, they're about 100 grams, 120 grams. So what we do is we throw some feed in. If the fish are hungry, they eat the feed. If they're not hungry, they don't eat the feed. The sensor picks that up and the sensor stops feeding. I didn't know the fish actually got fed about three or four times a day. It's a different type of food and what they do each time. It reflects the flavour of the fish at the end of the day. I found that quite fascinating. Watching Davy, our guide for the day, was fantastic. Seeing his passion and his knowledge for not just the salmon industry, but for fishing in general and for Tasmania as a whole was yeah really great to see and you think of fishing as just going out on a boat and getting a catch but to see that there's a whole element of research and development that goes into putting food on our plates and things and making sure that there's a sustainable product for generations to come. Cameron and Taz is a, a family business, we're in the third generation. Generally one in two Pacific oysters you eat in Australia is going to originally have come from Cameron of Taz. They were going through all of the, the processes and letting you know that like informing you about the vertical integration. The oyster farm actually do everything from ground level up, cutting out any of the transport and logistics, everything's done in house. We come, we pick up the long line. So under each one of these floats, we've got two of the packs of oysters, it's got eight trays on it. Generally speaking, we get about 10 dozen to a tray, about 1100 oysters per pack. We actually harvest about 80 dozen in no time. The 2.1 million oysters on the farm at the moment, they'll get touched every six to eight weeks. I was impressed by the fact that um, the oyster farm chose to farm quality over quantity. A lot of intertidal farms have got much higher density, so per hectare you could be talking two or three million oysters on a hectare, whereas here we place that over 60 hectares. They have the capacity to produce a lot more oysters than, than they are, but choosing quality over you know, mass production was, was something really important. Ben was fantastic in his explanation of uh, varietal characteristics particularly, so his oysters versus Coffin Bay or um, Sydney Rock oysters was fantastic in how he can pick the subtleties in flavour and texture and also simple things like shell formation and, and different periods that the shell grows at it. Yeah, so his knowledge of his product was, was really brilliant. So when that person eats that oyster, they look at the environment that it's in and they go, this is great. I physically cannot buy this in China, Sydney, wherever it may be. So yeah, we really try and focus on the providence because really that's what we've got. One thing I uh, definitely take back was just understanding and being able to explain to guests and staff how they grow from the very spawning right through the very end and um, all the little subtleties. Welcome everybody, this is our farm, Cloudy Bay Homestead. It's a relatively small farm. We have our points of difference in the market with our lamb. It enables us to be a bit more intimate with our animals and our land. So we're here for the sheep, but we appreciate our environment and we want to do the right thing by both. I like how open this farm is and how natural his lambs are. People often comment that our lamb tastes like lamb used to taste when they went to their granddad's farm years ago. These are essentially purebred Coopworth sheep. The muscling in the legs of these guys and in their rump and across their back is giving you the fullness in the meat with loins and legs and cutlets and racks of lamb. That's what these guys are designed for. We have one line of sheep that we breed with these Coopworths. 
so that all of the young females the following year are kept for breeding. You can see up there on, on the, the hillside there's probably nearly 500 sheep there and they've all been crossed with these black faced rams. They do everything on the farm from shearing, sending it to the abattoir but using the wool as another byproduct. Every week I'm taking lambs to market and I'm trying to get a lamb that is the correct weight, has got the, the meat that you guys want on it as chefs. So I need to be assessing these lambs and I assess them every week. The one thing that I found out today was learning about the different weights and the weight that they have to be before they get to slaughter. Because we're trying to get a weight, a live weight of lamb around about 45, 48 kilograms. The thing that I would take back to my kitchen is learning about the different breeds and the different ages and how the flavour changes through all of those different steps and processes. The pasture here we have not put any chemical fertilisers or any mainstream sort of sprays or toxins on the soil. Some of these pastures just have a mix of little herbs, clovers, two or three different types of grass. The longer the animal can roam around and be foraging, it's got the ability to take in more nutrient, and so it's more nutrient dense in its bones and in its, in, in its meat. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> So today uh, the group travelled to Joseph uh, Cromie Vineyard outside of Hobart, which is quite a picturesque environment. So our first bottle of wine was sold in December 2006. Uh, the cellar door opened in December of that year. Uh, we're now about 35,000 cases, so it's, it's big for Tassie. It's small in the scheme of things. So we do everything on site. About 70% of the wines uh, produced and sold is sparkling. And obviously it's due to, to our location. We're, we're 41 degrees south. And it's just perfect for growing Chardonnay and Pinot and they're the building blocks of the sparkling wines in Tassie. Supply is just short of demand, which is a really good way to be. We want to grow sustainably. We, we don't want to be replicating problems of, of years past. We want to be market driven, not production driven. David at Joseph Cromie showed us around the whole facility. All these crates that you can see, this is all the sparkling that sits in, in the bottle, in the apple crate for anywhere up to 18 months for our non-vintage, five years for our vintage, our reserve is 10 years. There's a lot of labour of love and time goes into making the wines. From bottling to their barrelling, all the way down to where the label is stuck on. So this is sort of, the lid comes off, the, the wines go in, it goes from about to about minus 20, and then that's the disgorging unit there. I learnt a lot more about the problems that, that winemakers face and how they overcome them and how it actually defines the characteristics of certain wines and really good having the young waiters there because a lot of them had strong wine knowledge so they could kind of help you along and guide you along. Today we've come out to Mount Norman Farm to their 93 wonderful acres out here, playing with the pigs, walking around the property, it's been incredible. The breed that we focus on here at Mount Norman Farm is the Wessex Saddleback. They are really, really critically endangered breed. There was hardly any left in Australia, so we thought it was a good breed to support. They're really lovely pigs, and they're suited to a free-range environment. We saw how he was cross-breeding them to get desired effects from the pigs that he can actually use in the market that we need today. At Key, we get asked quite a lot about the details of the produce, what the farm's like, um, how they're treated. They also want to be told a story, and I think that that's really important. We're kind of delivering that story from the hardworking producers to the chefs that work all those hard hours to come up with a premium product. And then it's our job to kind of sell the story and, uh, and, and share some of that passion with the guests. Yeah, we're really happy with the shed design. When it's really wet in winter, the water runs away from the shed. They stay a lot drier. And the other good thing about them is that it's really warm right in the back corner. So the piglets go in the back part to stay warm. So they're less likely to be rolled on after the first couple of days. So these little fellas, coming out at the moment are ready to be moved. Then we move about eight sows into one paddock together with all their piglets. And those piglets will stay all together through their whole life. And then they'll have their piglets together. And if you, sometimes you might have, say, 17 piglets in a litter and only five with another sow. And if they come in within 24 hours of each other, you can actually transfer some of the piglets from the sow that had 17 to the one that had five. The sow does a better job of rearing the piglets and more piglets survive. My favourite part of the visit was being able to interact with the pigs. You know, just being able to see how they actually live and run around. Like the farm around here is just incredible, right? You can see mountains, sea, 
the dirt that he's got on this property is incredible, so I guess that actually generally reflects how the pigs are going to taste. And the opportunity to be able to feed the pigs as well was incredible. Had fun doing that, it was interesting, to say the least. You can always tell when a pig's hungry, it's not quiet. We feed our pigs a grain mix, but we're bringing a lot of nutrients out onto the farm. So it's really important that we move the feeding points, the sheds around so the nutrients are spread evenly across the paddocks. So when we bring the bike in, we can feed you know, at least six paddocks of pigs in one go, maybe more if we split up the paddocks more. We've got sows and probably about six week old piglets just down here. They're about ready to wean. Then we've got um, sows and little piglets here. They're about two and a half, three weeks of age. And then we've got some growers on, up on the hill here and they're about 12, 12 weeks of age. It takes a little small part of your heart when you, uh, when you come and you meet these guys and I think that that, that is really what you take back uh, with the knowledge of, of exactly how, how the farms are run and yeah it's really nice to just meet the people and then uh, take that back with you. Since we left Mount Noman, uh, we had a good chance to have a vertical cheese tasting with Yuli Burger. We had cheeses from different ages and also cheeses that were three or four weeks apart in age to then four or five months or 12 months apart in age and you could see the different effects that that age has on the cheese in terms of ripeness and flavour and texture and everything, really aromatic quality as well. It was really, really awesome. You know, to me, the flavours should be balanced. They should be something you can enjoy. You want a lot of flavours there, but not massive flavours, but, but lovely flavours. We definitely saw a lot of different stages, just sort of the, the ripening of the cheeses, the ages, and the lengths of which sort of like two weeks would make such a big difference in the way that you eat a cheese, whether it's ripe or not. You can make so much different cheese from, you know, the same sort of process. It's all about the shape, the size, the way you mould it, the temperature. Completely different texture, flavour, smell. And again, we're very lucky here in uh, Tasmania to have these grass-fed cows because uh, that gives you the best milk to uh, create this, this type of cheese. This morning we came to Pine Garner Dairy Company um, and it's a really beautiful little part of the world. We are a fourth generation dairy farm where we produce our own milk and we are the home of farmhouse cloth-bound cheddar. So the cheese has been around for around about 21 years now. We're one of the only uh, companies to do traditional cloth-bound cheddar where we stir the curd. Our milk has been around for around about 19 years and we only pasteurise our milk for 72 degrees and 15 seconds and all our cows are robotically milked. Basically the cow comes into the robot, the robot arm will come underneath, clean the teats. After the brush goes away it scans the teat coordinates, milks each individual quarter and detects the flow of milk. After that, the cow gets a back scratch. A little back scratcher comes down, says thank you for milking and off it goes. They've got three milkers that can do 70 cows each, so 210 cows throughout the day, up to four times a day. I think it's good to have this method, but what they're saying is so there's no stress on the cows. They're coming in when they feel like they need to be milked and getting the best product from the, from the milk. We're lucky enough to actually go downstairs and to the cellar and you know, see the different stages, the ripening of the cheese, how they turn it, what they coat it with. From the newest cheese to six months old, you're looking at roughly turning once a week. Even tapping the cheese too hard, you can put defects in the air, cracks through the cheese. So yeah, it is, it is very important so you're being very gentle with them. They do everything incredibly small batch and artisanal and by hand, and there's a lot of elbow grease that goes into actually making pine gunner cheese rather than it being automated, which is really, really uh, awesome to see. Through the process of cheese making, they um, stir the curd by hand roughly about several times before it goes into the hoops. When they're doing that, they're testing acid levels and, and then once they get the acid levels at the right level, they'll knock it down with salt. That'll just stop any acid developing and then they're popping the hoops. It's quite a simple process, but you know, the time and the, and, the, and the love that they put into it makes a really great product. You know, the texture and the acidity and, and the, and the flavour profiles, just like old times. The end product is such a high quality thing because of the amount of hard work that goes into it by the guys who literally, you know, all they do is make cheese with their hands at the end of the day, which is really cool. As you can see, the guys have learned so much and there's so much more to learn from Tasmania's amazing producers. So next time you're in Tassie, make sure you take the time to seek out a taste of the island state.